Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you back this morning. As was mentioned, there uh, is going to be a Q&A, but um, as some Q&As have gone in the past, can I encourage you not to ask questions about your spouse? <laughs> yeah, I've had wives sit there and go, what do you do when a husband just won't, and he's sitting right there next to the door, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but all other questions are fine, and um, look forward to that time. Well, it's, again, a blessing uh, to be back this morning and to bring God's word to bear. Uh, we want to always start with God and honor him and his glory. Uh, we often want uh, to quickly get to Ephesians 5, and let's get to husbands and wives and all of that, but the first four and a half chapters are absolutely critical. And if the Lord isn't first, uh, we won't love properly uh, our relationships. Uh, we think of uh, the book of Ephesians that we're looking at, uh, mainly uh, some of the different texts, and they're committed for their love for one another, but 30 years removed, and what is the Lord writing to them in Revelation chapter 2? Uh, we often call and refer them to the loveless church. And they had left their first love. And you know what had happened? They also left their love for one another. That was a consequence. There's nothing to commend them about their love for one another. They loved doctrine. They loved uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, but they didn't love the people and they didn't love their Lord. Uh, and so that it can happen to all of us. You know, we're not immune to that. And so it's a good reminder that we keep the Lord first and foremost, and we honor him, we <laughs> seek his glory. Spurgeon uh, said, he said, I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, and so speak peace to the winds of trial, as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. Uh, it just takes us up where we ought to be, thinking about the eternal and our minds on him. Now, once that's going and it's going well and we're in Christ, we're thinking of Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we've trusted in Christ as our Lord and Savior, now living out, uh, living in light of the gospel truths of Christ, uh, we quickly want to get to uh, Ephesians 5, 22 and the, the marriage relate. Well, no, not yet. Uh, we want to move to Christ-like attitudes. Christ-like attitudes. Pretty much at the hinge of all the different epistles, it'll address attitude before it gets into relationships. Uh, in light of the gospel of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, it then pivots. It's a therefore. And it says, now walk in a manner worthy, but then it addresses attitude. And when I'm counseling, I don't find, I've never heard, and nor will I, here on this earth, someone say, you know, can you help my husband? Uh, he's just way too humble. <laughs> or could you help my wife? She just loves me way too much. I won't hear that, I never have, but it's always the lack of humility, the lack of, of love that we deal with. And so as you're looking at, uh, let's see here, okay, the current scene. This is what we're up against, and I appreciated Pastor Rob uh, working even at the title of the conference. It's how to have Christ-like marriages in light of a very self-focused world that we live in. And in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, it's like we're reading the news or listening to the news when I read this portion of Scripture. And the last seasons started when Christ ascended. But he says in uh, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self. 
Now just think about that. Man has always loved himself, even since Genesis chapter 3. Well, the, the scriptures is filled with examples of self, sinful self-love, unrighteous self-love. Lovers of self. You go, yeah, but at the end, as the Lord's getting close to returning, you're going to see love of self on steroids. It, it's going to be all about me. And you can see that. I mean, you, you hear it. It's promoted in our educational system. Our whole culture is man-centered. But lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, number one issue for divorces, uh, irreconcilable differences, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, and not loving good. They're treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And even in the religious realm, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And then it says avoid such people, especially those who make profession of faith and then exhibit these kind of qualities. And, but we're thankful that even in the midst of those difficult times, in verse uh, 15, and how from childhood, he says, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Even in the midst of the most difficult, challenging times, God still saves. Amen. Always has. He delights in saving, and he still sanctifies. Amen. We can still grow in our Christian life, no matter how dark it gets. And in light of how the news is going and whatever happens, whatever happens, God still saves, and he still is sanctifying his people. And that's good news for us, right? That's the gospel. That's the good news. So there's some things that we're dealing with in our culture, uh, even in our sinful flesh, uh, often referred as narcissism or uh, a sinful self-love, just preoccupied with self. And that would be the secular word, uh, kind of the look-at-me generation, but it's just a sinful self-love. You know, there's a righteous self-care for yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's a righteous kind of self-care for yourself, a self-love. Uh, even the Puritans would talk about that. There's a righteous kind of love for yourself where you uh, seek uh, to protect yourself um, and what's good for yourself. But then there's a sinful self-love. And that's what we're usually talking about here. It's a sinful preoccupation with self Selfishness, even looking at Webster's Dictionary, the concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, well-being, without regard for others. And uh, we're familiar with this. This is something we battle every day. Uh, the flesh wars against the spirit. So we have this battle from the minute we wake up. Uh, it is a battle that the spirit can help us win but uh, we're familiar with this. Uh, D.A. Carson, uh, talking about the selfishness of man, he says, our self-centeredness is so deep, it's so brutally idolatrous, that it tries to domesticate God himself. In our desperate folly, we act as if we can outsmart God, as if he owes us explanations, as if we are wise and self-determining, while he exists only to meet our needs. He calls it domesticating God to serve us. And uh, I have uh, found, listening to people, that there is a form of identity theft going on. Uh, Dr. Peter Gentry refers to this in a book that he co-authored with Dr. Wellam. And he says, this identity theft is going on uh, like on a, a tsunami in the church today. And it's taking God's name and putting on everything you want and think. Uh, and he, he writes, that's a form of taking God's name in vain. 
It's a violation of the law of God when we take God's name and we put it on any desire we have. You know, God gave me this desire, God laid on my heart, and God this and God that, and it doesn't meet up with Scripture. I had someone just recently tell me the Holy Spirit revealed that she had been abused growing up by her father. And I said, did you have any re recollection of any of that uh, before she went to this marriage therapist? And she said, no. So the Holy Spirit revealed this to you. She goes, yeah. I said, well, that's, that's not correct because the Holy Spirit wrote a few different times that it's by the mouth of two or three witnesses let matters be confirmed. And if you have no recollection of this, it didn't happen. But this is the kind of thing that's going on is taking God's name and trying to domesticate God, that he is here for us and to do whatever we want. And we dare not do that. We stay with the word of God and honor him and his word that way. But selfishness, um, again, this is our battle uh, throughout the day. Now, another form of, of selfishness, a way that it promotes itself, is through manipulation. And I'm, I've read a little bit on this. I have seen it. I have used it uh, in marriage, simply so, and repented, and even in parenting. But manipulation is to control or play upon by artful, unfair, or insidious means, especially to one's own advantage, to change by artful or unfair means so as to uh, serve one's purpose, manipulate. And there's covert and there's overt expressions of this. Uh, overt would just be, it's my way or the highway, take it or leave it. <laughs> you don't have to guess what I'm thinking about or what I want. But covert is insidious. And it, we see it a lot uh, in uh, relationships. For example, do you cry and pout and complain and give the cold treatment to your spouse until you get what you want? That's artful selfishness called manipulation. Do you get angry and use your anger to intimidate? But you don't call it anger. You just say, I'm distressed. I'm miffed, ticked, irked, irritated, annoyed, bothered, upset, frustrated, but I'm not angry. Do you constantly talk about your hard life and times so to manipulate others to have pity on you and support your sinful complaining? Do you use I care for you language, but it's only as a means for your advantage to get what you want? And do you make threats to get what you want? Do you buy things for people in order to manip manipulate them so now they Oh, you. Do you use the look what I do for you and have done for you and this is the thanks I get kind of statements? Oh, I could go on. I've got like 50 of them here. Uh, it, it, it's it, so insidious, this selfishness. And you can just see why this attitude of humility and love, these two attitudes just permeate the New Testament. Uh, humility and proper Christ-like love. Before you even get in to sit down with someone and talk about them and talk with them and care for them. Uh, if I'm going to talk about roles and responsibilities without this Christ-like attitude, it's not going to work. Uh, we're jumping to frame five again without the others. And so it's important that we look at the gospel. It's all in light of the gospel, uh, what Christ has done for us, who he is, and what he's accomplished for us. That's chapters one through three. It's all about him and what he has done and what should be produced, the most natural outflow of life in light of the gospel is humility and love. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Pastor Rob, where are you at in Ephesians preaching through? Are you at chapter 4 yet? No, we're just starting chapter 3. Okay, all right. Okay, you can, you can correct anything uh, 
that I, I say, um, and it's, it's not correct. I'm, but you get into chapter four, and again, this is in light of who our God is, who we are in light of him, and we were sinners, no hope, we were hateful, we're enslaved to various passions and pleasures. In Titus chapter 3, verse 3. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And look what God has done for us. And in light of all of that, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, or I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk. And that's, that's habitual practice, your lifestyle, each and every day in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And then look at these attitudes. Look, look at this, the attitude before we ever even get close to chapter five. With all humility, gentleness, again, which is the opposite of sinful anger. With patience, that's with difficult people. Bearing with one another, that's a non-sin issue, just putting up with people in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That's the kind of attitude that should be produced as we reflect and live in light of Christ and what he has accomplished. And I just want to focus, first of all, I've called this session a, a humility refresher. Uh, so I have to talk about pride because that's we're probably a little more familiar with that. Uh, everyone has some. It's just where is it and how much. And then so I'm going to focus primarily the first part of this session uh, this morning on the lowliness or humility. It's what Jesus described himself in Matthew 11. He said, I am meek and lowly of heart. I am humble of heart and gentle of heart. Uh, and then this afternoon, I want us to talk about communication. How do we even communicate to one another in light of uh, the, the good news of Christ, the gospel? And then how do we even understand conflicts? So I don't know about you. Sometimes my wife and I will be in a conflict. I'm going, how did it ever even start? Uh, how do we even get to this point? So I'm going to talk about conflicts uh, in trying to pull them apart and the different aspects that can lead to a conflict, and then how do you resolve them for the glory of God. And uh, I won't be able to get to all the roles and responsibilities, but you know what? That isn't the difficult part. These sessions really are. This is, boy, Lord, help me be zealous in these areas of giving him the glory and honor to work at humility and love, to communicate like Christ, to resolve anything, try to uh, keep from conflict, but if there is one, how to resolve it for the glory of God. And it's amazing what can happen with husbands. Now, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And wives, submit to your husbands. Wow, that it's not as difficult. Challenging, yes, but not as difficult uh, when you have these uh, major points being addressed in your uh, each and every life. So I'm going to start here with a humility refresher, and I'll give you just a little background, and I have a lot to cover. I won't be covering every little single point in your notes, but I, I, I like, I told Pastor Rob, I like just giving more information so you can go home and study it yourself and work on it, meditate on it, look things up, not a lot of fill in the blanks kind of thing. Uh, I didn't even know I had an issue with pride. I really did. Uh, I was uh, growing up in a home. I had Christian parents, uh, three other siblings, brothers. Uh, we grew up in a rural area. And uh, I was very quiet. Uh, I was scared of people. Uh, so I just didn't talk a whole lot. Uh, my parents called me shy, timid. Then Dr. Dobson comes out with self-esteem. I had low self-esteem. So I, had all, I, I was just quiet, introverted. And uh, I made numerous professions of faith, as most do, growing up in a home with Christian parents. And, but I was not converted. Uh, none of my brothers were either. We all made decisions for Jesus, but there was no change in our life. Uh, we lived for our own advantage until I was 18. I had an opportunity. I was getting 
worse and worse as far as hating the light and hating my parents who reflected the light. And so they gave me an option uh, when I was 17 that I could go to a boarding school, a Christian boarding school. And I just thought, just get away from home. I didn't even care if it was a Christian boarding school. I didn't even know what I was asking about. You know, the Lord must have just chuckled on that one. Like, you're going to go out of a home into a Christian boarding school and have Bible classes all day. Uh, and that's what happened. And God graced me with saving faith and repentance uh, when I was 18 at a boarding school in Asheville, North Carolina. And I can remember, uh, all right, how can I serve God? I don't like to be around people, afraid of people. <laughs> so I loved the outdoors. I, I grew up outside. I was more outside than inside. I just loved camping, backpacking, you name it, anything out. I'll go help the Lord take care of his general revelation. I, I'm going to go into forestry. So uh, away from people, up in towers, look for smoke. And I, that's where I was headed. And uh, it was, uh, I went uh, to a Bible college uh, just to get gen ed, first of all, but then I quickly learned in the first couple years at college that the only two things that last for e eternity on earth is God's word and people's souls. And I thought everything else is going to burn, including the forest. So I thought maybe I ought to invest more into people's souls with God's word. But I was still very fearful of people, uh, and I went on to seminary. And first semester was homiletics, where you have to preach in front of people. I couldn't sleep the night before. I couldn't eat. I don't know if any of you have this kind of like social anxiety disorder is like the number one uh, anxiety disorder, uh, at least in a secular realm. Well, I, I had it. I had every issue you can imagine. Uh, just scared to death. And there were just 10 guys sitting in front of me in a lab. And they have an evaluation form. And they're checking things off. And I haven't even started speaking yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was pitiful. It was awful. Afterwards, the prof said, uh, you didn't look very comfortable up there. I said, that's an understatement. <laughs> and he said, what were you thinking about? And I said, I was uh, thinking about what they were thinking of me. He goes, oh, that's your problem. That's just pride. I, I, I never heard that before. That's just pride. You're thinking about you. You should just be thinking about the word of God, present the word of God to the people of God. It's not about you. So I heard the first time that I was being proud. I asked that prop. I, I've kept up with him for years and years, uh, a mentor in my life. And I remember uh, at an evening service one time, and I gave that illustration afterwards. I said, uh, Dr. Zemek, do you ever remember saying that to me? He goes, oh, no, 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 I don't remember that. He said, I had to say it to almost everybody. <laughs> it's like <laughs> common affliction. Uh, and then I got married. My fifth year, uh, and I thought it was pretty spiritual, single. I mean, I had all the fruit of the Spirit. I loved myself, kind to of myself, gentle with myself. I, I, don't, I was fine with myself. I was at peace with myself. <laughs> then I got married. And I thought, oh, Lord, she's bringing me down spiritually. <laughs> A godly woman. No, 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 no. The Lord knew what was in my heart, and he was just bringing people in to squeeze my, my heart, and what was inside was coming out. And then to help her, little sanctifying agents called children come along and do some more squeezing on my life. Uh, but I remember, uh, that was about five years later, I said something about someone, and my wife said, honey, that just sounds so arrogant. That's the second time I've heard. Uh, I, there's a pride issue. And then I started pastoring a church uh, in South Carolina, and uh, I did not, it did not go well with an older woman and her husband. She was just throwing criticisms out everywhere about everybody. And so I called them to ask them if I could talk with them in my office. And she just started coming at me with all kinds of criticisms. And I just fired back at her. I, I, did, I was overcome by evil, and I just went right back with evil and just went after her. 
And she said, you proud, arrogant young man. Well, that's the third time I've heard that. And I remember a little quote by a, a Roman Catholic humorist, G.K. Chesterton, who said, if someone calls you a mule, just consider the source. If two people call you a mule, then look for hoof prints. And if three people call you a mule, just go get a saddle. <laughs> it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? That's the biblical reference there. And so that launched me into a study of, uh, obviously, I have a problem here with pride. I thought pride is just boasting on yourself, and I wasn't doing that. So let's just try to take a quick look at this. And this is in your notes. All right, this is just in your notes. Of, uh, and a very quick, I'm just going to skip like a, a rock on water here, on biblical terminology. Uh, I mean, pride, God hates it. Uh, it is an abomination in the sight of God, pride. Uh, I read there Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2, but Proverbs is just replete with exhortations about God's hatred for pride. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone who's proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will, go un he will not go unpunished. You see a man more wise in his own eyes, there's more hope for a fool than for him. In Proverbs 26, 12. In Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. I don't know how the elections are going to go, but I'm just telling you, the arrogance may have been what cost if, if we, I'm saying that if the uh, Republican Party loses I just think that probably was the issue. People can't stand the arrogance. It's like they miss what is happening and all the good things. But that, that pride, that self-focus, uh, it, it destroys uh, relationships. And uh, we need to continue to pray for people in office that they would uh, recognize there is a God and humble themselves and give him the honor and glory due his name. Well, I didn't want to get political. I'm just, uh, I think most know this already. So Old Testament language for pride is kind of a self-exaltation. It's a boasting on oneself. It's a lifting up of oneself. Uh, and the New Testament, similar language, even with the Greek terminology, uh, you're lifted up, and sometimes it's combined with minded, so high-minded. One particular word means to be enveloped with smoke. Uh, you're proud. You're enveloped with smoke. Uh, you're a legend in your own mind, or you can't even see. You can't see clearly. You're enveloped with smoke. And there are lots of biblical examples in the Bible of pride. We'd start with Satan. Satan. Uh, that's where sin began in heaven with him. And on earth it began with Adam. But Satan just wanted, looking for a vacancy in the Trinity. Uh, he wanted to be uh, from him, by him, and to him belong some things. Uzziah, the king who said in 2 Chronicles 26, when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. And we see that in, in continually, little snapshots with David, with Solomon, just um, their heart becomes lifted up. In Deuteronomy 8, be careful is a warning to, to Israel. When you come into the land, be careful that you forget God. You forget them. And you think that you planted these crops and you built these cities? You, you didn't do that. And he says, your heart will become proud. And it was a warning to them. You have Nebuchadnezzar on the rooftop, that from me, by me, to me, belong Babylon. It was my idea. I, I made it. I built it. And it was from my glory. That was the last thing he said uh, for seven years. You have the Pharisee in the New Testament, Luke 18, praying to himself and boasting on himself and all of his uh, accomplishments and looking down at the publican next to him. King Herod in Acts 12 mentioned him last night where he's thinking he's the provider for these people. He gives a speech, his ability, and he takes the credit and God kills him because he get, didn't give glory to God. 
So lots of examples in the Bible of pride and lots of warnings. Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. All right, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, right before a temptation. Well, just don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Now, pride defined, it's self-worship. It's what it is. It's self-worship. One author, when he was writing, said pride, just the middle letter says it all. The middle letter, I. It's all about I. It's self-worship. It's really thinking that somehow good has come from you or good has been done by you or good needs to come back to you. And that's that sort of unholy trinity of from me, by me, and to me belong all things, rather than to God, from him, through him, and to him belong all things. To him be the glory forever, in Romans 11. So it's this self-worship, but what is fooling, and it fooled me, I was deceived, uh, is the self-pity flip side of boasting on yourself. It's the wannabe boasters. And I didn't even realize this, but that's where I was living for all those years. Of it, I wanted things to come from me. I wanted things to be done by me. And I wanted glory coming to me. I wasn't standing up on a rooftop thinking I'm the greatest. But it's the wannabe greatest, right? It's the wannabe attention seekers. And they can be, oh, I just can't do anything. I just can't. I, I can't do this. I can't do that. Have you ever been around this before? Have you seen this before? Maybe in your own life? You really see it with kids. But kids grow up and they become more refined as adults. But kids will do that. You know, I can't. And what they're trying to do is manipulate you to praise them. They're, they're, they're crafty, right? And you just see adults doing the same thing. And I was doing that. I would manipulate my parents. They made me take piano lessons, and so I play the piano, and they go, oh, that was so good, Stuart. No, I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> oh, no, we didn't hear any. Oh, yeah, I made quite a few. It's, it's wicked. It, it, that's pride. And I began to just see it everywhere. It, wow, many manifestations, like an octopus with many tentacles, pride is. Uh, uh, my wife and I were doing a pre-K, uh, teaching pre-K class at church, a lot of coloring. <laughs> and this one girl sitting be between two pastor's kids, uh, associate pastor and the, the senior pastor, so the boys. And this girl sitting in between them, and they're coloring Joseph's rope right? And the guys are coloring the paper and the, and the table. They're just like big strokes. Uh, this is awful. And she's coloring in the, all the lines. Everything is just right. And I said, wow, that is really pretty. She goes, I can't color. And I had a thought. I didn't say it. But I was going to say, you're right, you can't. <laughs> I'm just going to agree with her. And she knew she could color. But you follow that? It's, it's pride. It, it's not just the boasting. It, it's the, uh, you fix a, a meal. No one says anything. Well, that, that's not going to work for you. <laughs> I spent too long fixing this meal. Uh, is something wrong with the meal? Something wrong with the food? No, no, it's great. Oh, OK, that's all I needed here. <laughs> So it's just that, that, that seeking praise and glory, uh, we trespass, right, in God's territory. And so what is pride? Uh, well, it comes from our sinful flesh. Uh, pride is the mindset of, of self. But look at the sinful flesh, even the definition of it. It really is seeking your own ends and wanting no one telling you what to do. That's our sinful flesh. Self-seeking, self-serving, and wanting independence. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. Now think about that right there. I want what I want, and I don't want anyone telling me what to do. And take that into marriage roles. Husbands, be that leader, lover, learner, 
long suffer. That's not going to work if the sinful flesh is really going, because it's about me, and I don't want anyone telling me what to do, even Christ, because men are submissive to, their, to Christ. And then a wife submitting to another, a man, and then trying to love him when it's all about her, and she doesn't want, it, she doesn't want anyone telling her what to do. You can just see that this right here, if this isn't worked at, really refreshing humility and love, you get in the marriage roles and responsibilities, it's not going to work. And you don't fix it down there in Ephesians 5, 22 and following. You don't fix it down there. You have to come up further into honoring God, the gospel, just front and center, and then a Christ-like attitude of humility and love. But what is the definition? You really are focusing on yourself. This is pride. Uh, you're pursuing self-recognition and you're desiring and to control all things for self. It's just, it's self. Uh, it's the mindset of self. It's, it's a king's mindset. That's why I had that thrown on that guy. It's like a king's mindset. So focusing on self, pursuing self-recognition, and a desire to control and use all things for self. Now, once I just started looking at the, uh, the words and the verses in Scripture on pride, and this is from my own study. This was years and years ago. It was devastating for me, uh, the manifestations. I was a young pastor. We had two toddlers at the time. My wife had been... Uh, was struggling with depression before I even knew how to even help someone with depression. I hadn't been exposed to biblical counseling. She had been abused growing up, and I just I didn't know how to help her. And then here I am, and I'm I'm finding out about pride in my life, and I'm thinking, oh, uh, I see it here and here and here. I mean, it's like you're meditating on the truths of God's word in your life, and it 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 reproves you. God's word's profitable for instruction and reproof. And I, I was just laid out um, seeing so many manifestations of it in my life that I thought, oh, I should resign from being pastor. I should let my wife find another husband who can, and, and, and the kids would have a father. That, and I, I was getting into more manifestations of pride, which is self-pity. Poor me. Right? I wasn't thinking about the Lord. And that's the downside of these manifestations. You can't dwell on these and stay there. You need to see them, sort of the bottom part of an iceberg. You need to see them and then move to Christ. You, you, you got to move quickly to Christ. Linger there, really see it in your life, and then see what you need to do to replace it. But you go to the cross. You go to Christ. You don't wallow around in self-pity. Christ is the answer. And so I started looking at these manifestations. Now, there, I put them in there in your notes. Uh, and I'm very familiar with most all of these. Uh, complaining, especially against God. And you go, well, I'm not complaining against God. Well, if you're complaining about anything, it's who, who's the one who gives all things? Who's in charge of everything? Well, I'm just complaining about the circumstances. Well, who's sovereign over those? Don't be complaining about who is elected. Uh, it's God's man. If you, if you think about God's sovereign plan, everything works according to his sovereign plan, right? Ephesians 1, 11, everything. And it, it's all moving according to his plan, whoever is elected. Now, it's gonna be hard and for sure, but I'm just telling you, we get our eyes set on the Lord. We do not complain. In the Old Testament, people disappeared when they complained. <laughs> so we, we need to give thanks in all things that God is sovereign. He's our king. Uh, lacking gratitude is another manifestation because proud people think they deserve anything and probably even better than they get. Then you have anger. A proud person is often a sinfully angry person because it's all about them. It's not what they're, they're not getting this or things didn't go their way. I mean, I think about road rage, especially out in Los Angeles. What is that? Well, it's not a disorder. 
It's, it's a proud person thinking, why is anyone else on the road? <laughs> why is anyone going slow in front of me? Why would anyone think about coming in off an on, on an on-ramp in front of me? That's the thinking of a proud person. And so sinful anger is a result. Or seeing oneself better than other people, looking down at others, having an inflated view of your own importance, gifts, and abilities. One humorous guy wrote, the donkey, you're just like the donkey that thought the shouts and palms were for him. <laughs> when they were for the Christ whom he carried. Or being focused on the lack of your gifts and abilities. Perfectionism is another manifestation of pride. You can't be perfect. And if you strive to be perfect in something, you're going to leave everything else unfaithful. You're going to be unfaithful in everything because you can't be perfect in everything. And it'll be anything that you do will be for attention. You do not want to put all your time and attention to something no one will ever see. And so you'll take people, if, you, if, if the house has to be perfect, you will take people on tours. You want to see the house? Well, not really. <laughs> You, know, I, I, you almost hear some of these things, and I just have to watch myself because I can get myself in trouble. <laughs> but perfectionism is not a virtue. Uh, it's a manifestation of pride. Uh, talking too much or talking about oneself, the, the conversation is like, look at me, listen to me. It's all about me. I saw a cartoon that... Garfield said to Odie, Odie, I'm tired of talking about me. You talk about me for a while. <laughs> um, seeking independence or control. I want to be sovereign. I want to, I want to be over people and circumstances. Well, that's, that's God's uh, attribute, not mine. But this, to want that controlling, and I don't want to be dependent on anyone. I want to be in control. That is a manifestation of pride, or consumed with what other people think, a man-fearer, man-pleaser. But that, I, I knew that very well. That was, for me, like on steroids. Being consumed with what other people think of you, or being devastated uh, if they, any criticism comes your way, or being unteachable, or sarcastic or hurtful, a lack of serving. Proud people want to be served. Or if you do serve, it's to get attention. It's just, pride is insidious. It, it, you see why God hates it. It, it. It's overt and covert. A lack of compassion. Being defensive or blame shifting. There have been a few occasions where uh, I, I <laughs> my, my dear wife Zandra, we've been married for 40 years, and there are a few times where she's come and she really thinks through, okay, I'm gonna have to, I need to address Stuart about something in love for his good. And so she'll come and, and I, can, I can hear things she's trying to say and I know what's coming. You know, it's like, thank you for this and thank you for that. I'm going, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and she brings up something and then a couple of times she has said, honey, why is it when I come to talk to you about you, we end up talking about me? <laughs> and I, I have chuckled because I know what it is. It's pride. It's being defensive. I don't want to talk about my problems. I can see yours a whole lot better. Uh, you follow that? that? That defensiveness is our pride. But uh, just... How is that possible that we end up talking about you? A uh, lack of admitting when you're wrong, a lack of asking for forgiveness, a lack of biblical praying. Proud people don't pray much. Uh, they don't think they're, they need the Lord. Or resisting authority or voicing preferences when you're not even asked. P people are voicing their preferences. You don't even ask them. We've had people say, why do you have your couch there? In our house. Why do you have your couch over there? We like it there. <laughs> no, no, no. It belongs better over here. 
We didn't ask you. <laughs> Do you follow that? It, it's people who have just tons of preferences and they want to arrange everyone's world and life the way they want it. You can just see this, why pride, it just, it just oozes out. So voicing preferences, minimizing your, your uh, failures and you maximize other people's. So everyone else has the log. Oh, you have just a little speck. And this is what Jesus was going after in Matthew 7 of switching that around. Deal with your own log first. Being jealous or envious. Using people. Uh, deceitful by covering up your sin or fault or mistakes or using attention-getting tactics or not having close relationships with people. Uh, you, you don't want to work at it. Proud people don't want to work at relationships. And then I put etc. These are manifestations of pride. It's not do we have any, it's just where is it and how much. And this will just make havoc of relationships. You want to deal with a, a, a husband and a wife and working in a Christ-like way in chapter 5? Not with pride. It, it is de being destroyed and devastated before you even get to roles and responsibilities with pride. One guy came to me and said, did you write like 30 manifestations of pride? And I said, well, if it's from a chapter in the husband book or a pamphlet, yeah. Uh, and he goes, I hate you. And he says, my wife and I, we had, had to go for marriage counseling, and the pastor said, I want you to circle every one of them that apply to you this week. Just dwell on them and then circle whatever applies. And he said, it was a rough week. He circled 27 out of 30. And he gave it to the pastor, and the pastor said, what is it about the other three you don't understand? <laughs> so, you, you can't move to humility if you don't see pride. And sometimes what I have learned is people go, oh yeah, I have some. And it's the tip of the iceberg is all they see. The ones who live with them see underneath the, the big part of it, and they go, oh, I got a little bit, yeah. No, it's huge. So linger there a little longer. And promoters of pride, pretty much anything that has self in front of it. Self-serving, self-love, the unrighteous sort, self-actualization, self-esteem, self-pity, self-assertiveness, self-confidence. When you think about, uh, just put self in front of, of a whatever the issue is, and it's pretty much pride. I mean, there are some self, self-denial is a good thing. A selflessness is, is a good thing. Self-control is a good thing. But most things, it's not good. But there is a righteous kind of boasting. Paul said, I boast uh, in the Corinthians, and both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He was boasting, but what he meant was, I'm just, I'm so thankful to what God is doing in and through you. And he, he, he say, I'm just proud. I, I'm proud of you all because you're being yielded to God and look what he's doing through you. It wasn't about lifting up any person in and of themselves, but the context is what God is doing through his people who are yielded and, and obedient. So the proper response is stay there, linger there a little longer, but then you, you got to quickly move towards Christ. You have to quickly move towards Christ. So now you're in the area of humility. And this is uh, bow low. When you look at Old Testament terms and New Testament, bow low, a one word in the Hebrew language means to be crushed. Just bow low. You get the opposite of the high lifted up. It's bow low. Even Psalm 99 says, exalt the Lord and then worship at his footstool because he's holy. Just bow low. Worship at his ottoman. Biblical examples of humility, there are quite a few in the Bible of examples of humility. And um, a lot of the patriarchs are talked about as being very humble. Uh, Moses, uh, there, he was the most humble man on the face of the earth in Numbers chapter 13. And who wrote Numbers? 
kind of work that kind of works your mind a little bit. Um, uh, he wrote it, so Moses wrote it. So, but it was true. Uh, he was more humble than any man on the face of the earth. Uh, he was all about God and His will. And uh, but you have uh, Mary. Uh, be it done to the handmaid, a humble handmaid of the Lord. Uh, Paul said with humility of mind in Acts 20, he said, with humility of mind, I served you uh, to the elders at Ephesus for three years. Our greatest example is Christ. Uh, he is the epitome. He's humility incarnate. He, 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 you want to look at humility, read about Jesus. Just especially the Gospels. Go back and forth, just watch him. He's humility incarnate. And we don't even get a really good grasp of that without thinking of him in glory first and what he relinquished to come to earth and what he took on uh, humanity and added it to divinity. And so when you look at Philippians chapter 2, uh, three things that really describe his humility as he was submissive. The father sent the son and he submitted. And he came as a bond slave, a, a servant. And he lived sacrificial, even, in, even to the point of death, death on the cross. So three different words really do describe this humble mindset. How am I doing in humility? Well, am I being submissive? Am I seeking to serve other people and love them? And am I giving sacrificially? Not when it's convenient. Not when there's an advertisement. You know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you in a second here, but wait till, till an advertisement. And then we'll have 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, the way advertisements go on TV. But no, sacrificial giving means it's going to be inconvenient. It's inconvenient. There'll be a lot of opportunities for that if you're married and if you have children. You know, all kinds of opportunities to be inconvenienced. But love is sacrificial. Uh, humility defined as God worship. And the definition is same three words, but it's a servant's mindset. It's not a king's mindset, it's a servant. Christ came to serve, not be served. In Mark 10, verse 45. So you're focusing on the Lord and others and you're pursuing recognition and exaltation of God. You want his glory first and foremost uh, and to please him in all the things that, that you do. You see that with uh, 2 Corinthians 5 where the, Paul said, it's my chief goal, whether I'm alive or dead, to be well-pleasing to him. But it's a servant's mindset, not a master's. The so same three words go in each of those definitions. Then you look at manifestations of humility. I, I'm not going to go through them all, but they weren't hard to come up with, even looking at them in Scripture, because it's the opposite of pride. And the Lord helps us to get there. We can't do this on our own. It's not man-made. It's the Lord in us to will and to do his good pleasure. And the Spirit of Christ helps us to point us to Christ. And so here are some things that really help uh, humble yourself in light of the, the gospel of Christ. If you go, boy, I just like, oh, it's just more of me, then I need to reflect on what God has done through Jesus Christ on the cross, resurrection. Uh, you just start dwelling on the truths of the gospel and it humbles you. One of the effects, he's lifted high, we bow low. And then some practical steps is just ask God to search our heart. Where is it? And uh, you can even ask others, uh, those who are closest to you, where are the manifestations of my life? And I, I wouldn't start with them. I would start with yourself, meditating on them, and then say, I've marked all of these. What do you think? Let them be the second person to give input, not the first. You have already done the work of looking then run it by uh, those who are closest to you. But review the Old Testament. God is high and lifted up all through the Bible, but the Old Testament, sometimes people just spend all their time in the New Testament. And that's unfortunate. The New Testament's built on the Old. And 
uh, you know, just to stay, start being wise. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, uh, to see him who he is. I mean, it really makes you think through complaining when you read the Old Testament and see what God thinks of complaining. I mean, it has an effect on you. It did when I was growing up. My dad would be reading the Bible and talk about, why these people just disappeared. The whole, whole group of them, gone. Earth opened up, swallowed them, closed. Then he says, time for bed, guys. <laughs> uh, I was going to complain, but better not. <laughs> but it's a right view of God and his holiness and his character hasn't changed. Also, just study Christ in the, Old, uh, in, the, in the New Testament and the Gospels. Again, that, just get your eyes on him. He's humility incarnate. And then several other things that you can do is, uh, I already mentioned, ask uh, someone close to you who knows you, loves you, preferably your spouse, uh, to give input. And just spend focused time really worshiping the Lord uh, in his word. Uh, he, the, it, it's not the written word that gives you life. It's Christ who is revealed in the scriptures. In John chapter 5, he says, you search the scripture. You're thinking life is in there. No, it's that, the scriptures that reveal me, he said. And so we, we don't want to miss the living word from the written word. So it's not all about the written word. It's the written word reveals the living word of Christ. And so we always want to get to Christ and, and as he's revealed in scripture and then practice the one another's, uh, just how to love people more. Loving God more and loving people more, and less and less of me. And then you can look at the various manifestations. Where do I need to put more time and effort and work on some areas, maybe more than others? And have the mindset that humility is a way of life. It's, it's growing more and more into the image of Christ, uh, humble before him. Boy, that goes such a long way uh, of a husband's role and responsibilities, a wife's role and responsibilities. Without a humble mindset, it's not going to work. And that's why it sits here, not only here, in Romans 12, as soon as it turns, now walk in this manner. Verse 3, don't have, don't think too highly of yourselves, then you ought to think. It, it, it just right away deals with pride. Colossians 3, clothe yourself with humility. And Philippians 1, right at the end of chapter 1, is talking about this turn. Now, this is how to live in a manner worthy. Have this mindset in you that was also in Christ Jesus. It's right pivotal. It's right at the hinge. And so it's important that we address that. Now, I want to go to, time we have here, a love refresher. So a humble mindset, but a love refresher. And you're, if you're in Ephesians, just turn to chapter 5 for a second. Look at verses 1 and 2. I mean, love is all through the book of Ephesians. The love of God, the love for one another. But Ephesians 5, verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So how should we be loving one another? Like Christ loved the church. It's right there, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And it's not just talking to husbands. Right? It's not just talking to husbands there. It's to all of God's children need to be walking in love the way Christ loved and gave his life for the church. Now, husbands are really held to it three times lower in this chapter. He goes after the husbands. You're held to this. You've got to be doing this. But it's really for all of God's children to love like Christ loved the church. And even in here, uh, he says in Colossians 3, a parallel passage, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion hearts, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing uh, with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love. 
just sort of ranks it up there, just above all, put on love, which bonds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you do indeed, on which you indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So now we're in the area of a refresher with love. A good reminder, even from last night, is who we all once were outside of Christ. We live for ourselves. That's who we live for. And it was unbelief uh, towards God, but praise him for the gospel that he graciously gave us. And now when we have repented and fit, put our faith and trust in Christ that he has blessed us with and graced us with, now we grow much more in our faith, sort of exercise our faith uh, towards God. So an unbeliever lives more for their, their own advantage. A believer is much more focused on living for the glory of God. Of uh, Another passage that says the same thing, for the love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live, and it's a key word, uh, these uh, for there, a date of advantage, it's for themselves, but for him. So which way are you habitually facing? For yourself? Or are you habitually, not perfectly, facing for Christ? That's what those two fours are. An unbeliever lives habitually for themselves. We are born that way, uh, in sin, all about ourselves. But a Christian habitually is living much more for the advantage of Christ. How can I please him and what I'm doing? A way that I try to visualize this uh, passage is living for your own advantage is everything circles around you. You can see this. I mean, you've got a lot of parents here. You're, you're, when they can begin to, to talk, it's not about you. Uh, it, it, it's not, hey, mom, when you get a chance, I know you're really busy. Could you get me something to eat? Or could you change my diaper? <laughs> it is welcome to my world. It is all about them. And everything revolves around them. It's living for your own advantage. And if a person's not a believer in Jesus Christ, they're still living that way. I don't, need, I don't know how any two unsaved people can last in a marriage. Because it's all about self. And usually it's one idolatrous lust compensates for another idolatrous lust. So I have a need to be needed and I have a need to be served. And so it all kind of works somehow, but it's all self-focused, living for one's own advantage. But when God gracious us with salvation, then every one of those areas starts being transformed. Now you don't love the world habitually. You don't love the world habitually. Sexuality is for purity in the confines of marriage in a way that you give an intimacy to your spouse. You look at the area of work. It's not how can I work less and make more. It's how can I work for the glory of God. Every area really gets transformed. Uh, and I won't go through all of them, but every one of them is, it's a whole different focus in Christ. Even appearance is the inner man now. It's not the outer man, it's the inner man. And others, it's not they're here for me, I'm here for them. Uh, Ed Welch, uh, who's written on a book called When Man is Big and God is Small and the Fear of Man, he says, we need to need people less and love people more. Need people less, because that's self-focus, and love people more. It's more about them. So whose advantage are we living? And see, I, I, uh, in the beginning of the husband book, I start with, when I got married, we had three sessions in premarital counseling, and it wasn't, it wasn't really that great. It was, why do you want to be married? And 
The second was, is there anything you want changed about the other person? And then the third session was, what do you want for the wedding ceremony? So the first one is, why do you want to get married? Well, um, we really like each other. We want to spend our life together. Um, the second session, now this should have been a tip off for any, any counselor, when I had a list of things I would like changed with her. And she didn't have anything for me. That, if I, if I knew what I knew now, I mean, if I knew then, uh, no, 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 no. I'm going to be meeting with you, Stuart, alone for a while. And Zandra, I would say, keep distance from him until this guy is straightened out. Because when we got married, it was like two in love with one. She loved me and I loved me. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Now, Zandra says it wasn't that bad. It was bad. And I was a Christian. I wanted to go into ministry. And it just tells you about ministry and everything else. It, it was more about me. Now, it wasn't all that way, but it was a, a lot. I look back now, and you know, as I learn more and more, I thought, oh, Lord, uh, he graced me amazingly with her. And uh, she's grown a lot in her sanctification, married to me. But um, whose advantage are you living? And I'm just going to say to parents, your, your children can make early professions of faith. More than likely, they will. They're going to hear the gospel, you know, camps, all, all kinds of things. They're going to make decisions for Jesus. And, and God does save. And he does save children. But be careful. Because... It's hard to see a life change habitually until they have more independence. And so they, they have to do what mom and dad say all the time. But when you don't see any interest in the things of God, they like going to church because their friends are there, but it's not because they want to hear the word. They don't want to spend time in prayer. They don't want to love people. It's still about them. Don't don't try to give false assurance to them. Uh, and especially in the teen years is where I think it's pretty much exposed to which way you're facing. When they have more independence, which way are they facing? Is it habitually towards themselves? And I don't want anything really to do with the Lord. Or habitually, I, I do want to please the Lord, and I'm working at this and I'm working at that, and I really want to uh, obey him and love him. Which way are they facing? And we just uh, would bring that up to our children from time to time. Just we're, we're, we're kind of wondering about where, how you're facing and the choices that you're making habitually. We don't see much about the Lord anywhere. And it was at 15 when our daughter said to, to us, Dad, I'm not a Christian. And I was really thankful that she came to that because I didn't think she was. But that's, just be careful as parents. You go, oh, I remember, you know, when they made some decision for Jesus when they were four, we carved it in a tree and we even videotaped it. Uh, no, it's, you pray that God does this. Parents can't save their kids. God does that. And whom he will. He has mercy on whom he has mercy. He has compassion on whom he has compassion. As long as there's a lot, they are alive, there's hope that God might do that. But I just want to encourage you as parents, just be careful that your goal is not the salvation of your children. You can't achieve that. You can't achieve salvation for your children. You, you're an evangelist for sure. A discipler, maybe. You can teach and instruct, but um, it's God who changes the, the heart of man. Uh, one lady said in one of the churches where we were at, she said, no, it was my goal to always get my kids in Harvard. But it's not my goal anymore. It's the salvation of my children. <laughs> I looked at my wife and I said, be easier getting to Harvard. <laughs> I'm serious. It is a miracle for God to take a heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. That is a miracle of God. Not so much a miracle to get them into Harvard you have enough money. Now, Christ-like love defined, and I'm going to kind of go quickly through this. 
uh, just looking at Ephesians 5, you look at the Gospel of John, 1 John 3 and 4, and you, you taking these passages, what is Christ-like love? It's selfless. It's selfless, and it's an enduring commitment of the redeemed heart by faith in Christ and our thoughts, affections, and choices to intentionally care for and benefit the true needs of another person by righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and sacrificial actions by the enablement of the Spirit and for the glory of God. That's a long definition, but it is taking John chapter 3, John 10, 1 John 3 and 4, and all the things it says about the Lord's love for us, and then how do we look at that and how we love one another. And, and I would just say keep away from books like Love Languages. There's nothing about the gospel in the Love Language book. Nothing. Nothing even say the gospel. One Bible verse in the entire book. And the premise of the book is, I will give to you what you want if you give to me what I want. Now, it just, it's not patterned after scripture. Now you go, well, it's kind of nice to know there's different, exp yeah, there's different expressions, but someone shouldn't say my love language is gifts. So get me gifts all the time. Uh, it's just, that's just not even what the Lord, it's so reductionistic and gospelless. So just kind of be careful of what's out there and it's hot sellers kind of thing. Uh, be leery of that. What does the Bible say? We start with God. What is, he is love. He defines himself as love. How does he love? And that would be a more working definition from the passages. Now, it's displayed and demonstrated perfectly in Christ. He's love incarnate. You want to see what love is? Look at his life. Again, submissive, servant, and sacrificial. My dear wife, again, coming from a very difficult uh, background, home life, uh, she kept asking me when we were first married, do you love me? Yeah, I tell you all the time, I love you. <laughs> Don't love in word, but in deed and in truth. It wasn't really till I was start acknowledging my selfishness and repenting and start sacrificially giving to her, she stopped asking me. It wasn't words. And then imperfectly, there are a lot of people in the scripture uh, that, that loved, sort of a Christ-like love, but imperfect, right? Christ is the perfect example. All of them, they loved as a reflection of God's love, but imperfect, but still good pictures. And then I have described, and since there's nothing to fill in here, let me just highlight a couple of these. So I'm just going to briefly go... Because husbands, you're mandated to do this. Wives are to love as well, like Christ loved the church. Right? Remember, don't, don't forget Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. We're all to love like that. But it takes the uh, initiative. That was so helpful for me. Um, my wife is very outgoing. She's so, I, it's what attracted me to her. I was like in, into myself, and she was very outgoing. I, I like being with her. But it went into our marriage, and we'd walk up to someone, and she'd say, hi, I'm Zondra, and this is my husband, Stuart. I'm like, uh, I'm supposed to be a leader? Um, and it, I didn't take the initiative. She did. And in churches sometimes, you know, we have a need, something has to be done. Women will raise their hand, you know. They'll take the initiative. Men need to be... Be first. I have to say how I how I say that. Uh, men have to <laughs> be first. You take the initiative, and that helped me immensely. And so I said I said to Zandra, Zandra, you're going to have to pull back, and and I need to step up. We had to work at this. She's just she's just going, and I said, no, I'm going to try to pull you back a little, and I need to get it in gear. And she would say, you know, well, you tend to be laid back. I thought that was a virtue. <laughs> and I looked in the concordance, laid back, couldn't find it. <laughs> laid out dead is in there. <laughs> Laziness is there. 
Slothful is there, but not laid back. Laid back is not a virtue. And I needed to start moving forward. So then I, I would, hey, I'm, I'm Stuart. This is my wife, Zandra. And she wanted me to take the lead. And that's, that's working. Roles, responsibilities is realizing where we're at and what needs to change for God's glory, right? For God's glory. And so love takes the initiative. It's not that we loved him first. He loved us first. He took the initiative. It's sacrificial. It's humble. We've kind of covered a lot of these. It's volitional. You choose to love. It's not you feel. Uh, don't let feelings lead you. It, love is action. More action. All the, They're all verbs. It's more motion than emotion is even if your enemy's hunting you down to kill you and is hungry, feed them. Like, I don't have warm feelings for enemies, but no, it's volitional. You love contrary to who the person is and maybe what they're doing. And again, all these are in your notes. And it's committed. It's just committed, not for 10 days, not for 60 days of purpose, is committed till the Lord takes me home or her home, uh, as long as we're married. It's, we are committed to this. And I remember asking my wife, because her parents were divorced, her grandparents were divorced, and I said, so tell me what you think about divorce. And she, I mean, we're just kind of dating at the time. And she said, it's not in my vocabulary. Oh, wow, that's a pretty neat answer. And we'll work through things. We'll work out as much as we can. Now, there are some biblical grounds, I, I believe, in certain situations for a divorce, but this kind of love is just committed. Let's work it through, and it's forgiving. Uh, we forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us, and it's purifying. We're really seeking each person to grow more into the image of Christ, and it's practical. You can see it. You don't have to guess anymore. You should be able to see sacrificial love. We don't ask God, prove that you love us. He demonstrated it to us, right, with the, the life and death of his son. So just real practical, how can I express love uh, that can, not just in words, but in deed and in truth. Now, the description of love, I'm not going to walk through this. I'm already uh, out of time. But it's there for you. It's not a definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. It's really a description. It's a description. So it's all listed there. Uh, and I think it, uh, maximum impact is very helpful. Wayne Mack wrote a book on this, and he said it was one of the most powerful books that, I mean, life-changing for him was on really looking at love and where he needed to grow in his love for others and for the Lord. But just unpacking that, you can read what love does, what it doesn't do. And then I have uh, a homework assignment at the end uh, for you all. And it's just looking at what love is and what it's not. And then just two questions. Ways I have not been and then ways I will change. And remember the point uh, I stressed last night, God won't obey for you. You can pray, Lord, change me, help me to be a, a better a lover of my spouse, but he will not obey for you. He will help you obey, but he will not obey for you. Uh, you can pray all you want. You can read all you want but it takes meditation on God's word with specific action steps. And this is what I need to do to change here. This is what I need to do to change here. Now prayerfully, dependently on the Lord, I'm, I'm moving in that direction and it's for God's glory. And that'll be a catcher too. It's not so your spouse is impressed. I remember one time she, my my wife was caring for one of our sick children, and the, the, uh, I'd come home, and the, the kitchen was a mess, and she had been doing all kinds of things, but caring for our sick child. And so I thought, ah, 
I clean up the kitchen. Next time she goes in the back and dealing with my, so she goes in the back, I'm, I'm like moving around, clean up the whole kitchen. Then she comes out, I'm sitting in the den, she comes out, she goes into the kitchen to get something, turns on the lights, closes the door, and she walks right back out. Didn't say a word, didn't even see it. Now, how do you miss that? <laughs> so she comes out again. She had to get something else, some Tylenol or something, and so she, and the lights are on, and she, she closes the, uh, the cupboard, she comes back through the den, she's going down the hallway, and that's, that's too much for me, that's not gonna work. I said, honey, she goes, yeah. I said, did you see something? Did you, did you, did you see what I, uh, what I did? Now, who was that for? That's it. You, you just see that? I, it's like, it, it, it is that sacrificial giving for the other, but it's not for you. And it's not that she gets impressed. It's for God's glory. He sees. It's to please him in all that we do, whether we're alive or dead. Whether she ever sees it or acknowledges it, you do it for the Lord. Everything that you do is for him. But that was just, as soon as I said that, and she said, oh, man, thank you so much. It's just like, yeah, I knew exactly why I did what I did. And I probably did it by my own effort. So it's prayerfully, dependently, humble before God, a refresher. Lord, help me to love you more. Help me to love my wife, my husband more my kids more, not so they think I'm a wonderful husband or father, but what a wonderful God, right? All praise and glory needs to go to Christ. Amen? Well, let me just close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Before our break, even before the Q&A, oh, Lord, we're, it's imperfect. You know that. It'll be imperfect till we uh, arrive in heaven. But until then, may we press upward. Uh, may we not, uh, as the scripture says, be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in the Lord, uh, serving him. Lord, just help us not to be laid back, but to be zealous. Lord, thank you that there's forgiveness for our sins and there is grace and mercy to help us to turn from sin and to grow in our faith in Christ. And for those who are having a very difficult time uh, physically or in a very difficult situation, thank you that there is grace for the place that they're in. And it's always sufficient grace uh, to do what you've called us to do. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen.